I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. My guest on today's show is Dan Iveson, the group CIO of PIMCO, the legendary bond shop with nearly $2 trillion in assets under management. Dan arrived at PIMCO 25 years ago and assumed the group CIO seat in 2014, where he leads portfolio management for the firm's income strategies, credit hedge fund, and mortgage opportunistic strategies. Today's guest host is Anna Marshall, the chief investment officer of the $13 billion Hewlett Foundation and a repeat guest on the show. Anna has a longstanding relationship with Dan and PIMCO and leads us on a tour of the state of the fixed income markets and the role of the asset class in institutional portfolios. Before we get going, you might be wondering why we've added these humorous little anecdotes to encourage you to spread the word about capital allocators. Our first thought was that each of Hank and Morgan on my team and my wife on the home team find that I can be quite funny which doesn't really come out during the interviews. I could try harder by amping up the energy of my questions, like asking, hey, what's your investment strategy? Or maybe not. Now, keep in mind, their sentiment about my sense of humor is not universal. Each of my three teenagers, my stepson and my stepdaughter, question the quality of my humor from time to time. Or in the case of my kids, most of the time. So these clips give you a little window into my sense of humor, uh, for better or for worse. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy Honest Conversation with Dan Iveson. We have a lot to talk about, Dan. So thank you very much for joining us. And I want to jump in, but I first think the audience needs to know a little bit about how you got to where you are today. Maybe you could just start with how and when did you decide to become a bond investor? Thanks, Anna. It's great to spend some time with you today. I know we talk fairly frequently, but it's really nice to talk in a longer form setting and cover issues in a real tough market environment. But in terms of me starting, I guess I could probably go way, way back. As a child growing up in a small town in New England, I always had for some reason, and maybe it was a little bit odd, but a fascination for financial planning. I used to listen to Bruce Williams, a talk show host. He passed away a couple of years ago, but was quite popular on the radio, just talking about financial planning and things of that sort. So I guess I had a casual interest. After going to undergrad, getting a degree in economics over at Occidental College in Los Angeles, I went over to T. Rowe Price. At the time, I was in more of a servicing role. Over the couple of years I was with T. Rowe Price, though, I did gain an interest in the fixed income markets. And when I left there, I had become, I guess, a mini specialist in fixed income not dealing with major complex institutional type issues, but rather just talking through markets, having more specialized conversations with clients that had an interest in those areas. I had similar roles within the industry the following few years. And then in looking at the markets, looking at the types of roles that were out there and available, I just determined, hey, this is something that I really want to pursue. And I felt that it was necessary to go back and get a bit more of a technical education I decided to apply to schools that were very, very focused on finance more broadly, analytical finance, ultimately chose Chicago. And I guess I was that rare MBA student that had a pretty good sense of what I wanted to do. Now, I didn't know sell side or buy side, but I did value a much more targeted curriculum, not typical well-rounded MBA curriculum. And maybe that was a fault. Maybe I'm a little less well-rounded than I could be, but certainly got a heavy dose of exposure to the financial markets there. I met a lot of people that I still stay in touch with, even a few folks here at PIMCO I was classmates with. And that really, really got me incredibly excited about a career in this industry. Spent some time over at Bear Stearns, actually 
my internship was an extended one, worked on a home equity, which is a kind word for subprime housing related research piece with Tracy Van Eck, who ended up being a significant mentor of mine. And I guess the rest was history. Thinking I'd head back to the sell side, but ultimately interviewing with PIMCO late in the process and have been here ever since. I guess the seeds were planted very, very early in my life, but it really took a while post undergrad to really decide that, hey, I want to not just talk about the markets, but really get into a position where I'm able to take risk on behalf of clients as well. It's an interesting path because you've been mostly on the side of spread and credit risk your whole life. How did you come to work for Scott Simon, one of my favorite mortgage fund investors? What were some of the key lessons you learned from Scott while in your early days at PIMCO? Scott is the most important mentor in my career. I don't think I knew a whole heck of a lot other than that experience in subprime mortgage research, at least from the standpoint of institutional knowledge when I joined the firm. And at PIMCO, I don't care how specialized you were in some of the credit segments of the market, you got a healthy dose of macro. And not only a healthy dose in terms of learning what others were thinking, you were expected to get out there and do your own research, present to the entire firm on these key top-down themes. So I think foundationally, there was always those processes and that mindset here. So some comfort level and even excitement around macro. Macro typically does matter to some degree, regardless of your focus on more bottoms-up credit investing. I joined PIMCO. When I came in, they mentioned I would either join the short-term desk or the mortgage desk. The short-term desk typically is a more straightforward entry point. You're in the front end of the curve, learning the basics, then you extend out the yield curve or you extend out the complexity spectrum. For whatever reason, I got placed into the mortgage group early on in my career. And that can be quite daunting, trying to understand credit convexity, interest rates and interest rate convexity. So it was a bit of a trial by fire. Ended up doing a lot of things on that desk. PIMCO was a challenging place for new former MBA students to adjust for many good reasons, but it was challenging. And I had a bumpy journey early on in my career there. In fact, wasn't quite sure that PIMCO would be a permanent home for me. Then Scott came around and I think Scott was a great risk taker on Wall Street. He was a great researcher. He was an incredible communicator. In fact, I think his daily research piece was one of the most popular research pieces. He joined the firm and I think he attempted to remind some other senior people within the organization that I, like others in the trade floor, were young, not a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge and maybe give me a little bit of time to work things out. With a little bit of time, with a little bit of training, mentorship, I could be impactful in key areas of the market. So it started there in terms of him giving me the opportunity to settle in to what can be a very, very challenging role in a challenging organization in a challenging industry. And then over time, I think really, really helped me understand risk-taking, how to, over the course of a full cycle, position portfolios in a way where you have the greatest probability for success. And I learned a lot from Scott just in terms of the overall philosophy towards risk-taking. And of course, later in our careers together on the desk, he specializing on mostly the rate and the higher quality segments of the market and me focusing on the credit areas of the market turned out to be a great partnership where he respected my career growth. I respected his insights. And in fact, we partnered on a whole variety of products that were very, very new to PIMCO, but proved to be very, very important in generating client returns, particularly over the decade plus years after the global financial crisis. Talking about risk-taking, I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask what motivated you to take the helm during the difficult period in 2014. What was going on in your head at the time? You're sitting on a mortgage desk. You're doing great. Life is good. Was this the most challenging moment in your career where you had to really try to figure out, do you take the risk or was it just completely obvious to you? Well, not completely obvious, but what was probably less understood externally is that when Mohammed returned to the firm back around that 2008 period, He had put together what we referred to internally as a PM management group. It was basically a leadership group, small set of senior resources really there to help Mohammed, who was in a challenging position of not only co-CIO, but the CEO of the firm, obviously getting pulled in a lot of different directions. And then Bill wanted to really, really focus on day-to-day investment decisions. So I'd been part of that management team. It was a close-knit group. We had a little bit of turnover in that group over the course of a five or six-year period, but we really 
were delegated a lot of the responsibility for the day-to-day -day leadership of the platform. So I basically was focusing on income-oriented portfolios, the hedge funds, credit RV-oriented hedge funds, directional hedge funds, and even some other alternative strategies and then working in some of these leadership areas. So I had the experience and the relationships at a senior level. And over the last few years, I was the chair of that underlying committee. So I was perhaps a little bit less familiar externally, given the nature of the products that I focused on, but internally had worked very, very closely with Bill and Mohammed on the leadership angle. Now, with that said, that's phenomenal experience. It likely led to my transition into that role as being a logical one. But of course, theory is very, very different than reality. That transition was a little bit bumpier than I think all of us would have liked in retrospect. Certainly a big challenge. And I think a key reason why this worked well is I had a phenomenal leadership team that had very, very well-defined roles and tried to realize that anytime you're in a leadership position, you need to build out the team or work with the team based on your own skills and at times weaknesses. And what we look to do is take a team approach. Everything can't be a democracy, but really, really put people in a position where they could succeed in their respective areas. My role overseeing this group is very, very different than Bill and Mohammed's role and have a great team taking on very, very important areas of the business. So again, had this team mindset going in, was able to work with a tight-knit group going through some challenging times, always with an eye towards clients, client returns, the client experience and not being overly focused on near-term outflows, inflows, revenue projections. And we had a very, very supportive parent in Allianz who helped provide some structure and some incentive programs to get through that period. And I've enjoyed it. I enjoy it today a lot more than I did late 14, 2015 for sure. But it's been a phenomenal experience to work with a great group of people. And again, bumpy, but a lot of fun as well. So standing today, what was that culture that you wanted to build? When you decided, okay, I'm going to do this, but these are going to be the one or two things that are going to be the hallmark of the culture that I really want to be representing here. Let me start by saying, I didn't need to build a culture. The culture was in place. And I thought Bill Gross had established a great culture in some very, very key areas, an obsessive focus on the client, client returns, even when thinking about new strategies, always having an eye towards the market opportunity and whether, in fact, this business direction would lead to positive client outcomes, which is sometimes a little bit different. Some firms may be a bit more focused on, hey, what can we build? What can we sell? And let's try to do it the best we can, even though it may not represent the same type of value we may see in other areas. Now, that's a perfectly fine business model if people are very upfront about it. But Bill was very pure, very, very simple. We were lean. It was a tough culture and a demanding culture, but demanding because of this focus on client outcomes and the need to take that seriously. And if you can't fulfill those goals, you got to get training in order to figure out how to do that. Or sometimes it's just not a good fit and we got to upgrade, shift the process. And again, that's exciting for some, demanding for others. So there was no major need to fix anything. And I really wanted to respect the wonderful firm that Bill had built, a great investment process, and then look to maybe soften the edges in certain degrees, modernize where that's appropriate, and not that it was anything that we were doing poorly earlier. But in 2014 and beyond, these markets have become much more technical, much more driven by data, requiring a greater deal of precision. Our client needs had changed significantly throughout the years. When I joined the firm, we were basically running core money here in the U.S., core, core plus, core plus money over in Europe. And then we had a few targeted specialty businesses. By 2014, we had quant groups. We were making direct real estate investments. We had a hedge fund complex, very complex, multi-sector credit portfolios, other multi-sector type portfolios. And that would require a different type of resource over time a slightly more specialized investment process, and a bit of a shift away from just top-down macro thematic. We never wanted to turn our back on that. That was very important to continue to prioritize there, but to do macro with even more precision, with a keen focus on implementation and all the additional resourcing that requires. So bottom line, maintain the culture, the key elements of the culture that I grew up in, that I love, soften the edges a little bit to adjust to new realities. But then again, shifting resources in areas that were going to be critically important to generate returns in this new generation of financial market investing. So you have a great partner 
in building this organization that you envisioned. Walk me through the process partnering with Manny, PIMCO's CEO, to build the PIMCO of today. On a practical level, how have you built the type of trust that clearly exists between you two? The transition in 2014 was challenging on the portfolio management side. I think it was even more challenging on the business side. I think in some sense, I got off easy because we managed a few outflows, total return, a few more more steady outflows in other areas of the firm. But basically, the markets are the markets. Our team was mostly in place and fairly straightforward from that perspective. I was getting pulled a little bit more into the business side because it was, again, hard to separate some of the business challenges from the portfolio management challenges. And we got to a point a couple of years after that leadership transition where we felt we needed a CEO or at least embark on a search for a senior leader that had a style that would help take the business into the future and be able to respond to these rapidly evolving client needs from a business perspective. And we did a quite comprehensive search, spent a lot of time talking with finalists, including Manny, on what the firm was about, my own style and views on what it takes to add value to an organization like this one. And I think we really got to know each other up front. And what I learned from Manny very early is a great person. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean a great leader or a great CEO, but a great person that was well-balanced and thought could really, really set the stage for maintaining and fine-tuning our culture going forward and just making this an exciting place to work. We wanted to approach leadership as partners, but also understand our own responsibilities and be able to stay in our own lane. So from the very beginning, we collaborated. I ask him still to this day all the time, thoughts on what we're doing on the portfolio management side, fresh perspectives, checking in through his relationships. He does the same and it's been a great partnership. Well, now that everyone knows a little bit more about who you are and how you got there, let's go to what we love to do, which is talk about investing, because that's really what you and I spend all our time doing. But before that, since risk management is a big reason investors invest in bonds, maybe we should stop for a moment to understand how you define risk. You mentioned it a little bit earlier, how you think about risk taking and probability positioning. So how do you define risk? In some sense, risk is a healthy respect for the unknown and the need to understand the differences between expectation and the range of possible outcomes. And I think with risk in general, and one of the reasons why we have embraced some of the behavioral finance literature is that there's just a natural tendency for people in our seats to underappreciate the probability of extreme outcomes. From an active asset management perspective, the concept of risk management is absolutely critical and needs to be upfront in any type of decision around portfolio construction. I think a lot of times risk, and particularly risk in the old days, was viewed as an important part of the back-end process. You go out there, you put together portfolios, you run it through the risk engine or the risk managers, they tell you what they're concerned with, you go back to the top, you try to fix those and see whether you pass the risk test on the back-end. And I think that's a way of looking at it. You still need to have a very, very defensive mindset towards risk management. But I think, and Scott Simon taught us this a lot, it's really got to be absolutely embedded in almost everything you do up front conceptually, where you're looking at markets, you're looking at how markets are priced relative to their history. You're trying to get a sense for quality of the overall opportunity set and really you know, have this mindset of taking what the market gives you, but also balancing a more quantitative driven approach to risk management. We all do this with tracking error and vol budgets and incremental risk contribution and so on. It's all very, very important but also supplementing that with good common sense, intuitive-based scenario type analysis and really be willing to dip into economic history to look at more extreme events and then even get outside of the historical data set and really just thinking about concentrated exposures that can limit your ability to generate your returns you know, during challenging market environments. Then of course, avoid catastrophic type outcomes through a more defensive type approach. Let's talk about the opportunity set today. So 2020 was a really bad year for bonds. Let's just leave it at that. But since fixed income is a really large asset class, let's try to take it in sectors. Let's focus first on rates markets, and then we can do spreads markets. Starting with rate markets, what's the opportunity set that you see today? And how should investors be thinking about it? 
You're absolutely right. Last year was a terrible year for financial markets more broadly, both equities and fixed income. But fixed income, if you look at ag returns going all the way back to, gosh, the mid-70s, it was just a terrible year. And there's really nowhere to hide other than maybe some commodity markets, some commodity exporting currency markets. So it was rough. It was rough on investors. That's the bad news. The good news is in some sense when rates are near zero or outright negative in nominal terms, you need to have some adjustment to get value back in the market. And back at the recent highs in rates, there seemed to be pretty good, even really good value back within the public segment of the opportunity set. And I emphasize the word public here. Now, we've rallied off the highs, so I'm not going to pound this table the same way I think we did in a few articles back in the third quarter of last year, but there's pretty good value back in fixed income. And you can look at that in terms of nominal yields or real or inflation-adjusted yields as well. You look at the front end today, two-year treasury up somewhere in that 4.5% type range, a lot of high-quality spreads or even spreads with a little bit of credit risk that can quickly get you up into yields in the six and a half, seven, seven and a half, eight percent type range. That looks pretty good in historical context, pretty good in terms of what you'd expect to earn in the public equity markets with a lot more volatility. And again, inflation's elevated, but even at a six, seven, eight percent type yield, given current inflation levels, in our view that inflation trends lower over the course of the next year or so down towards central bank targets, maybe the 3% type range staying sticky to the upside. Now that's pretty good value. An obvious question will be, well, Dan, that's great, but inflation hasn't been that easy to predict. You got these crazy labor markets. Are you sure it's going to go down to 3%? The answer is no, we're not sure. There's a lot of uncertainty on the macro side, particularly around economic growth and, and this inflationary dynamic. If you look at real yields, if you want to insure against inflation a little bit in the tips market or other inflation protected markets, yields look pretty good. Again, off the highs, not as high as you saw pre-global financial crisis, but pretty good positive real yields in that one and a half percent or even higher range. So again, from a historical perspective, even if you don't want to take a big bet on inflation coming down we see pretty good value there as well. And then from the standpoint of spread sectors, a lot of your view on spread sectors is going to depend on your view on prospects for a harder landing. But high quality spreads look pretty attractive. Deeper credit spreads, bank loans, high yield, other areas of the market. After the recent rally, fair, maybe a little bit expensive, but reasonable value given the pretty awful sell-off that we all had to experience over the last 12 to 18 months. Given the volatility and just eye-popping moves in rates markets and in credit markets and in spreads over the last six months. How is PIMCO dealing with that? Are you trading more often? Are you thinking about this in terms of yield ranges and going back historically? How should we think about in a world where rates are no longer just one directionally declining for the last 30 years? Are we entering a market where we should think about fixed income as a more actively traded asset class? I'll step back for a moment. Not surprising, an active asset manager is going to say that active asset management looks pretty good the next few years. So maybe I'd be saying that even when I had less conviction. But we get together once a year, all investment professionals, global advisory board members, other outside speakers, and we talk about themes and trends impacting markets over, we used to say three to five years. I think increasingly we talk about five-year or even longer trends in the market. In the last few years, We've talked about a world where there's going to be less synchronized growth cycles, where inflation is going to be more of a challenge going forward, perhaps structurally because of some of the physical investment necessary, particularly you know, around this round of green energy transition, more geopolitical friction that's going to lead to less efficient supply chains. I could go on and on. So we do think you're going to have less synchronized cycles the prospects for more symmetrical challenges around inflation. And it's not just inflationary risk. You still got a lot of debt in the world and we got to watch very carefully for some of this debt deflationary risk to take hold when you have unanticipated growth shocks as well. But the bottom line is we do see more real economic volatility and uncertainty. And then when you look at financial markets, you have much less systematic risk taking from the banking sector. The banking sector is still highly constrained based on all the post-global financial crisis regulation that's in place. So you have markets that are much more prone to overshooting than they have been in the past. So what that means is to be very, very focused on liquidity management up front, but to have a very opportunistic mindset, particularly when you're operating in 
the public markets because with patients, with good careful liquidity management, we do expect to see more opportunities to take advantage of the liquidity needs of others, which again takes the form of overshooting fundamentals, which is exactly what active asset managers look to find in markets. Now, in response to the recent repricings and the ongoing macro uncertainty, we have made some shifts in portfolios. I'm involved day to day in our income strategy, which is one of the more flexible ones and serves as a pretty good proxy for what we're doing across the platform. We have taken our duration higher. About 18 months or so ago, we were running near the historically lowest level within our duration range. And as markets have become more attractive just from a rates perspective, we've taken that all the way up to neutral duration late last year. And now in response to the rally, we're a little bit defensive, but we're back towards what we would deem the neutral level for our respective strategies, a little bit underweight locally. In the spread sectors, our base case economic view is reasonably constructive. U.S. inflation heading back down to the high two level on the core side at the end of the year. Based on recent constructive economic data, slow growth, basically a 50-50 chance of a recession. And when you dump the numbers in our model, outcomes a fairly mild recession given reasonably strong economic fundamentals in areas that matter that we think in the base case will lead to some resiliency. So if that base case comes to fruition, lots of credit sectors can do really, really well. Problem with that mindset is that it can be really, really dangerous to invest based on a expected outcome. Tails are fat. One of those tails, when you're bumping around at close to zero growth, is a shock that drives you into a more protracted period of economic weakness. So we have been hesitant to be super aggressive in diving down into the most economically sensitive areas of the spread markets realizing and acknowledging if our base case outlook comes true, we're probably going to leave some money on the table. We may lag some folks out there that have a more positive outcome or think tails perhaps are less fat than we do. So what we've been doing is really over the course of the last few months, taking advantage of a lot of these high quality segments of the market that have widened in sympathy with more economically sensitive areas of the market. A lot of those markets have widened because people were selling fixed income last year, the Fed's reducing balance sheet where we think you can pick up attractive spread, participate in a rally associated with a softer landing, but not leave yourself open to more significant drawdowns if we end up being wrong and the economy either tips into a harder landing or inflation ends up lingering at much higher levels and where the central bank starts thinking about not just a 5% terminal rate for funds, but getting back up to 6% or even higher, which by the way, hasn't happened in a very long time, but it's not an outlandish outcome given where inflation is currently. So let's go a little bit into private versus public. As we get into the spread market, what type of illiquidity premium should investors demand for private credit, especially given the comments that you made about being flexible and being able to move around as the market tries to find its new equilibrium? People should look for meaningful compensation to go from the public markets to the private markets. One of those ways to measure compensation, of course, would be incremental yield or return expectation. Apples to apples comparisons, you've typically over a full cycle been able to generate two, 300 or even more basis points of incremental return in a private asset versus a public asset. Now, when yields are 3% on the public side, that could be double the return. Of course, at higher overall returns, it's smaller in percentage terms of incremental benefit. But generally speaking, you want to get pretty significant yield compensation all else equal. The point I want to make is it's not typically all else equal. There are other reasons why you may want to invest in the private markets. You can pick up resiliency. You can pick up control. You can pick up better documentation, which of course is a form of control. So we do think that Apples to apples comparison that some folks tend to make at times underappreciate some of the advantages than the private market. We do think and we do focus very much on where we can gain resiliency and sufficient additional investment protections, particularly in the more volatile areas of that opportunity set. And I think in certain areas of the private markets, you're able to do that to a significant degree. And it's another part of the overall value proposition for our clients when our clients look to shift into those types of mandates. But one of the things is what happens during this period as 
the world tries to find its new point of equilibrium. And how nimble or how flexible should people be within their fixed income portfolios? And then just advice for CIOs in general. I do think that we're in a very, very unique period where, first of all, public markets have reacted and reacted quite quickly to changing fundamentals, particularly the rise in interest rates or the repricing of public equity markets. You see those comps all around, whether you're looking at public BDCs, REITs, other large tech companies versus their private growth equity counterparts. And public markets always react first, quickly, and they sometimes overreact. That could present opportunities, but that's just the reality. And then private markets tend to move quite slowly. Now, the relative movements typically don't matter that much because you tend to have pretty long cycles with relatively low overall financial market volatility. But this was a massive repricing, and you have a massive divergence between private valuations and public valuations today. Sometimes that doesn't matter because you're in a locked up structure where the valuations are mostly for information purposes. But increasingly, private valuations have been valuations that have been used when money's actually changing hands. And this is going to create a very interesting dynamic where investors in this space need to understand that and appreciate that point. I think many do and react accordingly. So when we look at the market environment today, we definitely see more immediate value within the public segment of the opportunity set. A lot of people that may have left that market or are structurally tilted towards private markets really should think about public market opportunities today and where possible shifting those allocations accordingly. With that said, for an allocator, particularly an allocator with a longer term investment horizon, there are going to be phenomenal opportunities over the course of the next few years within the private opportunity set. Even if we have a softish landing, the rate shock alone is going to expose a lot of capital structures to considerable strain or stress. That doesn't necessarily have to happen with a big flight to quality crisis type event that we've all grown used to. This could be a very, very slow moving process over the next few years where patient capital can be part of the solution to help good companies, good real estate, get back to a model that's more sustainable. We do think for the patient investor looking again to take advantage of perhaps the liquidity challenges of others is going to be a very, very important theme for allocators. We just don't think you need to rush given the pretty significant macro uncertainty and the need to underwrite to some pretty challenging macro type scenarios. So bottom line, pretty good value in public markets today, private markets that are slowly adjusting to this new reality. There are some pockets of immediate opportunity, particularly coming from those platforms in the private space that are extremely motivated sellers. Again, I think you get a little bit more leeway there. And then the last point I'll make relates to rating agencies and ratings. Despite all of the criticism rating agencies faced during the global financial crisis and coming out of the global financial crisis, we still live in a world very much regulated based on ratings. We see it across the PIMCO platform where many, many of our mandates have explicit rules around how much double B risk can you own, how much triple C risk can you own. And there's a chance this cycle we're going to see meaningful downgrade activity that tends to happen with considerable lags. And that's going to lead to assets in motion as well. So once again, a reason why we're a bit more cautious in some of the more credit or economically sensitive areas in the market, but also where allocators can be pretty confident, especially with a longer term time horizon, to be patient and take advantage of what we think is going to be a real target rich environment. It may not be 09, 2010, absolute eye popping returns where almost everything worked in retrospect. We think it's going to be pretty good. If that was a 10 on a scale of one to 10, I think you're probably going to be somewhere in that seven to eight ranking type range for patient capital over the next few years in the higher return segment of the opportunity set. But since you don't think it's going to be this very obvious fat pitch, what signs should investors be looking for that it's time to be safe back in the water again? First of all, from a macro perspective, I don't know that it's ever going to be as safe as one may be perfectly comfortable with. Maybe using a going to the beach analogy, you don't want to go into the Cape Cod beaches anymore when there's a massive storm rolling through. When the storm passes, you may get out there on your surfboard, but there'll still be a few sharks in the water. 
I think this is a macro environment where there's going to be some sharks lingering around. So you want to be careful and diversified and generally prudent with risk taking. But from a macro perspective first, we'd like to see more progress on the inflation front. We'd like to understand and see a bit more data around the picture for labor markets to see that this inflationary trend is likely to be more sustainable. A byproduct of that would be central banks that we become even more confident in or closer to the end of their tightening cycle because the risky segments of the investment opportunity set are going to be discounted based on a rate structure. And until you know where real yields are going to end up, it's hard to get super comfortable with that segment of the opportunity set. So that's the macro point. Another thing that we like to think about, structural reasons why there may be an opportunity to earn abnormally high returns. And you're already seeing interesting signals that allocators should look to respond to. Gates going up on retail products that were perceived to be much more liquid than they were. Explicit strategies that have gates that need to open over a fixed time frame where they must sell over the course of a short period of time and where they're holding extremely illiquid assets. That's a signal that doesn't come around that often and has already been triggered and may be triggered even more significantly as we move forward in time. So there's already examples of areas of the market that should be a call to action for allocators of capital. And we're seeing that, for example, in the commercial real estate side of the business right now. It may not be scalable to the point where you're going to be able to go out there and launch super funds because there's less excess in the market, there's less financial leverage, there's less mark-to-market leverage in their space more responsible underwriting, servicing protocols, and so on. But this is an area where if it's sized sufficiently, there's going to be an immediate opportunity to be able to gain risk at levels where you can underwrite much more onerous economic scenarios. Then I brought up ratings, which I'll reemphasize again. When you have the prospects for meaningful downgrades, and when we look at areas of the market, the senior secured loan space as an example, that's going to feel the full brunt of central bank action because it's almost all floating rate debt. If we see even moderate declines in EBITDA over the course of the next few quarters, with the Fed at 5%, and gosh, 6% would be a real challenge, we think a massive amount of that opportunity set is going to be open and subject to potential downgrades. A non-economic regulatory rigidity in the system that should lead to risk trading at abnormally wide spreads relative to fundamentals. It's been a long time since we've had that type of cycle develop. It was going to develop with COVID, but of course, the fiscal agents and the Central banks came in so quick that they didn't let that opportunity present itself. But this time, with inflation where it is and central banks and fiscal agents doing what they're doing, it looks pretty attractive. So we do think investors should get ready now and be poised to take advantage of the regulatory and liquidity challenges of others. So that's not dive in, but that's weighed in, at least setting up structures and relationships to take advantage of that opportunity. An area where it involved much less would be on the secondary side, of course. A way to get liquidity rather than the GP selling assets, of course, is to sell that position on the secondary market. Once again, an area that may be a little crowded in terms of the people chasing that risk, but a pretty big potential opportunity set, again, for patient allocators that have liquidity and have a longer term horizon. Put yourself into my shoes. What are the one or two biggest challenges that I should be watching out for today as a CIO? always learn a lot from you when you talk about risks from your perspective, where you have a much more diverse portfolio, where you have different liquidity challenges. Obviously, we're running a mutual fund and we need to get our client money back at the end of the day if they want it. That's pretty important to manage that well. But in your seat, in the seat of a lot of your peers, it's a complex understanding of liquidity needs, liquidity management. How do you balance the public investments to serve those needs with the higher returns or more resiliency in the private market. So I think today, again, it's just realizing and not getting overly confident with a macro view. We talked mostly about economics today. We didn't talk about geopolitics, but it's very hard to get comfortable with traditional scenario analysis where you have the Russian troops massing across segments of the Ukrainian border. Once again, you got spy balloons getting shot down here in the United States. Tensions with China, North Korea, Middle East. There's just lots of risks out there in the world, consistent with what we've talked about in those secular outlooks I mentioned earlier. So again, have a very, very healthy respect for uncertainty and a thoughtful approach towards diversification. One example would be consummate geographic diversification. Typically, that's a good thing. But in a world that's politically charged, that may lead to 
naive or bad outcomes. I think it's important to understand today the different types of risks, particularly related to sanctions alone, that may present themselves to impact returns. And I know I'm meandering around, but the bottom line is appreciation for uncertainty, even relative to what we've grown accustomed with throughout the bulk of our careers. Also, the idea of of some put, someone coming to your rescue if things get out of line. I think with inflation where it is, with debt levels where they are, with political gridlock where it is currently, it's very dangerous to think that a rescue will come relatively quickly the next time we have a crisis-type environment. I think it's hard to time markets. We always tend to focus on those few people that manage to time them well over a given point in time. When you look at those people, and there's a lot of academic literature that suggests those that have time markets well over a certain period, when measured going forward in the career, tend to exhibit next to no persistence in being able to continue to time markets. And you've told me this before. It's all about finding great managers good alignment of incentives, and just continuing to do what you do. You're going to have bad vintages. When the bad vintages occur, it's like cat risk. You get the best opportunities on a go-forward basis, but allocators tend to get scared away or boards tend to get scared away at precisely the wrong time. Now, that's the reality. We're not going to change that dynamic. But having a mindset of just focusing on process as much or more than prediction, I think, is very important for investors as well, and probably more important in an environment where the road's going to be a bit more bumpy than what we've grown accustomed to. Great. Let me ask you just quick fire questions. So what are two things you like to do in your spare time that most clients don't know about you? I love to ski or go to the mountains. I'm not sure if I enjoy the lift ride up more than the skiing sometimes, but it's great to not have the cell phone ringing, just to be able to breathe some mountain air and just relax and think and get out and about. I do that with my friend, Scott Simon, wherever I can get him out there as well. And then some people don't know that I'm a parent. I started late in life, but I have a three-year-old and soon to be a five-year-old. Love spending time with them. Love going out and getting them involved in outdoor activities as well. And then I think people are well aware of my focus on Boston sports. That will continue to be a passion. And we're doing reasonably well, at least in basketball and hockey at the moment. Not so well in the other sports, but that's always a source of enjoyment as well. What advice do you have for people entering the business or people that have been in the business for, let's say, less than 10 years and are facing the prospects of thinking, wow, you guys lived through the glory years of 30 years of interest rates decline, and now we're facing a market that is much more complicated. Yeah, a few ones real quickly. Work hard. Work very hard early on to develop a foundation. I think it was easier for people like myself, Scott Simon, others in the business to do that back in the old days when you were pricing bonds on an Excel spreadsheet, when Bloomberg had these primitive functions where you're typing in delay dates, settlement dates, coupons, and pricing a lot of the risk yourself. You ended up honing your bond math, understanding cash flows really, really well. I'm going to sound like an old timer I am, but nowadays the computers do it all for you. And there's a tendency to be overconfident, I think, when machines are doing a lot of that work that provides you with a very strong foundation. So I think hard work's always important. And then in this industry, it's hard work, but also willingness to stray away from one's comfort zone. I didn't say this at the beginning, but when I was having a rough time in the mortgage desk, it was really rough to the point where they wanted to kick me off the desk. And they did for a while. They kicked me over into the currency space, which wasn't the most glamorous position at PIMCO at the time. But what I learned were currency forward points, rolling currencies, the intricacies of front end yield curves outside the US. So when I returned back to the mortgage desk, when Scott rescued me, I had learned more about a market that is relevant. And guess what? Today, I make some currency decisions around this place for portfolios. So I think hard work, develop the foundation, be willing to get outside the comfort zone and become more well-rounded. And then the last piece is... Read the economic history books, read the financial market history books, find people within your organization that have been around a long time. That's Chris Dialinus here at PIMCO. It's an absolute pleasure every time I sit down and talk to Chris. Chris is in the investment committee. He was around back when treasury rates were in the double digits, where inflation was high and never felt like it was coming down. It wasn't me. That was before my time. So if I'm not talking to Chris, if I'm not reading the history books, I'm not going to have a feel for that market, and it can lead to significant complacency. So I think, again, a healthy respect for the past, along with working hard, get outside your comfort zone and do some of the math that the computers are doing for you. It it stinks now. It's going to drive you crazy. It's going to pay dividends, I promise, later on in one's career. Dan, well, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the show. 
If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time. 